18, 1890s. Uh, the earliest one dated in 1870s or 1880s. So very, very early. Uh, I had initially I had one in a book, but because now because downsizing, right? We all have economic hard time. Stanford uh, University Press also gave me the word count: 100, uh, 110,000 words. I had twice as much, much words in my manuscript, so I had to cut out a lot of valuable information. I really want to share another way through the video. But so the, one of the stories uh, says that uh, a group of the Chinese, you know, one, one is, uh, his name is Yuan Ating from the Yuan family. He was, you know, the article said he was from an uh, aristocratic family, from a rich Chinese family. So when he uh, go to the class, he dressed well. He was wearing a leather shoe, you know, uh, very sharp. Uh, but the others are the laborers. One day maps, you know, common folks. And they were learning English and apparently they were very appreciative. And they gave their American, you know, <coughs> Victorian newspaper piece, oftentimes imitated accents, right? Immigrants' accent, American. Come along Sunday, you know, <laughs> eat some ludo. We have a fried rice. That's fried rice. Do you like fried rice? <coughs> on purpose. So the, the Chinese uh, students are very appreciative of their mannequin teachers. So in the, ad, uh, in the end of the session, they presented the, their teacher with their gifts we brought from China. Okay. Some of uh, the silk fan, you know, some of the shoes, you know, handmade. They were very intricate, uh, look maybe expensive. So they present to their teacher, show their appreciation. So this kind of interaction initially was all right. But gradually when this more and more contact occurred, white Chicagoans became suspicious and became anxious. And we'll talk, 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 talk about that later. And in this early Chinatown, uh, the Moy brothers were dominant. Okay, the Mei Dongzhou was the uh, mayor of Chinatown. Okay. So that title was not given yet, but according to all these newspaper articles, <coughs> uh, Mei Dongzhou was also known as Hippolong. Okay. Hippolong was not his name. That was the name of his business. It was uh, Hippolong E.G., Hippolong E.K. and the company, but the short Hippolong. But if you study immigrant history, you will know that. A lot of Chinese were confused. Uh, their name, actually, uh, the business name, right? They are known or they are called by their business name. So Mei Dongzhou was oftentimes referred as Hippolong. Okay, so a lot of newspapers uh, articles said Hippolong uh, was uh, happy today because New Year's come. And his uh, brother had a baby boy mom. So he's going to give a gift. I mean, he's going to give a feast through an uh, uh, elaborate party in the New Year's Eve, okay, to show their appreciation to their good fortune. And they invited the entire China to come. That had not been many people, right? 500, so they could afford it. You know, people come here, get drunk, and they get drunk, <coughs> and smoke, and they have fun. <coughs> so the, their store, Hippolong, was not only the grocery store where people buy the provisions for, the, for their daily cooking, for their weekly, uh, consumption, but also it was a center of uh, their social life, their recreation, entertainment. So the Chinese would go there, you know, in the weekend. <coughs> Sunday was the only day the Chinese laundry man would take off. They closed their shop <coughs> on Sunday afternoon. So they would hurry, and okay, the newspaper says them in twos, in threes, they uh, coiled their, their, their uh, long, long, long grab, the queue. Uh, they changed to their new robe, put on their immaculous white socks and their new shoes, and they hurried to the loop area, Chinatown, to have a good time. Okay. So this uh, hippo was like a social club, but it was also more than that. It's like a court de facto court where uh, Hippolong 
or Meng Moi Dong Zhou oftentimes would make a judgment. He would uh, dictate, okay, make a verdict regarding to the disputes among the Chinese residents. So his word was final. So that was Chinese court. So they not only controlled the uh, uh, Chinese, the living Chinese, but also the disease. Uh, regularly, you know, during the Chinese uh, uh, Qingming, which uh, falls in uh, April, right? so they would go to the uh, graveyard, right, which is a, a rose hill. Um, go there to burn some paper money um, and uh, uh, present the sacrifice, okay, uh, to symbolize food and money, send this food and money to their deceased country government. So a lot of newspapers also recorded this kind of stories. But this good time was not there for very long. Pretty soon, the Chinese <coughs> here also felt this vision pretty okay. um, The 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, initially, the term was 10 years. It will expire in 1892. So, so now, what are we going to do? So Congress, Renewed that that uh, that uh, law, so renewed for another ten years. Then in 1902, renewed again, and eventually in 1920s became uh, became uh, permanent. Okay. Until it was finally repealed in 1943. So this first renewal of Chinese Exclusion <laughs> Act was known as the Gary Act because the senator who proposed that proposal. And the Gary Act caused a, uh, a, a more tension, okay? because according to this Gary Act, and also this is so happened that 1892 was a year, a big event is going to happen. What was that? Exposition. Exposition, right. So the immigration authorities suspect that a lot of Chinese would be smuggled here, right? disguised as uh, workers or actors. They will hide among the Chinese immigrants. They will disappear because you can't tell. So to prevent that from happen happening, uh, the immigration authority ordered the Chinese in Chicago, as well as the Chinese in the other cities, to take their photo, okay, to identify them. So the government would have records. So they will not be confused with those Chinese illegal immigrants, undocumented. Uh, so the immigration authority came to Chinatown to take pictures. But this time, you know, Moi Dong Zhou usually was a good-tempered and a uh, happy-go-lucky person, uh, always happy. But this time, you know, one article said that he was upset. <coughs> he caught it. His three boy brothers refused to have pictures taken. Uh, uh, but other Chinese have the, uh, uh, the group picked outside. Then uh, outside hip hop. Then there are some reporters uh, interviewed. They uh, asked the one Chinese man uh, whose English was uh, fluent as a spokesperson. So then this man, <coughs> in, the, in the book I have the quote, this man said, you know, we pay tax. Uh, we, uh, we do everything Americans do, but why we were treated this way? Why we have to be taken picture like a criminal? So he expressed the <coughs> Chinese sentiments. So this is the first time, you know, publicly you, you see the Chinese displaced their, their, uh, their uh, grievance. And all the, uh, and the Chinese also took their own uh, action. Okay, as their numbers grow in, uh, as the white Chicagoans become more and more suspicious, the Chinese decided, you know, they. You know, this old nightmare, you know, the nightmare on the West Coast is still hunking them. Mm -hmm. They're afraid they will be purged again. So they decided to voluntarily dispute, I mean, distribute themselves, disperse. So they began to scatter around the city, you know, throughout the city. But that's not enough. Uh, and later on, the more events, you know, add, add more to this tension. In 1905, Chinese in China had a boycott, a okay, boycott of American goods. And that movement also uh, spread to U.S. And that movement actually was a, a result of the Chinese merchants react towards the mistreatment of Chinese in the United States. So the merchants, starting from Shanghai, 
the merchants in Shanghai boycotted American goods. Then the Chinese, Chinese Americans in the US also boycotted. Okay? So this was a big event, political event. Uh, that probably also added to this tension already there. And in 1909, there was a big, uh, uh, big uh, event. Okay? Uh, unfortunate event happened. It was known as a Chinatown Trunk Mystery. Yeah, which is recorded in, uh, in another historian, uh, Mary uh, Ting Yu Lu, who is a professor at uh, 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 Yale. Okay, Yale. And her dissertation later became a book published in 2005, 2005, recorded that incident. So that book, uh, and that is the event, okay? <clears> 100 <throat> years and 100 years later, you know, uh, it never failed to attract public attention. So at the time, it was the top news throughout the country. So all the news, the major newspapers began to uh, report this event, and they began to search for murder. Because this alleged murder was never caught, never found. <coughs> so this is what happened there is, uh, in uh, 1909, uh, a, a Chinese uh, a girl, a Chinese, um, Chop Sui shop owner uh, went to see, uh, went to look for his cousin because he hasn't seen him for a while. Then he uh, went to the, his place where he, he stayed, okay, his lodging place, and opened the door. Uh, nobody was there, but there's a big trunk. Okay? Uh, so he um, was not sure. Then he called the police. So the police and they opened the trunk. So they were thinking that probably is uh, the body of the cousin. So his name is Ling Long, uh, Leong Ling, Leong Ling's body. But instead, it's the body of a Caucasian female, a young lady. So later on, they uh, identified that was a young lady um, who had been missing for a couple of weeks. Uh, her name was Elsie uh, 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 Siegel. Okay. So this case also was known as Elsie Siegel case. Elsie Siegel work. Elsie uh, Siegel was uh, one of the American teachers. It's like the missionaries in Chicago worked with Chinese immigrants, Chinese laundrymen, Chinese laborers, teaching them English. But because of this frequent interaction, some of them, you know, uh, the friendship turned into a romantic relationship. Some really married Chinese. You know, there's a lot of uh, Irish women married Chinese men. You know, this kind of a, a union marriage was recorded by by uh, by Jack Chen's book. You know, his article and his book. So that was uh, uh, an interesting phenomenon. So here, uh, Elsie Siegel had been uh, romantically involved with uh, Long Li, and people didn't like that. <coughs> Uh, so she was uh, going out with Lang Long against her family's wish. But now her body is found. And that proved the people's suspicious that you know, the Chinese would seduce those innocent white girls, collude them, collude them, right? corrupt them, or even murder them. So this case really angered the white society. Uh, throughout the country, they began to search uh, uh, Longley in Boston, in Cleveland, in St. Louis. <coughs> they found the place really in Chinatown. And there's also some interracial couples or romantic relationships. And they were also attacked. But nobody could find this Ling Long. Nevertheless, you know, this became a hysteria. You know, this uh, read, this uh, read against the Chinese, against the Chinatown. <coughs> at the turn of the century, okay, in 1910s, 1920s, was prominent. So this anti-Chinese sentiment, or this agitation in Chicago also was going to blow up. But it didn't. Right? Maybe because the Midwesterners are milder, or maybe because the Chinese here are smarter, they were trying to avoid it. So it turned, turned into different form. Okay, this agitation turned to the form of economic sanction. The owners 